Hello, baseball fans. You're watching On Deck with Tyler Redman. Welcome to On Deck. I'm Tyler Redman. I'm here with a very special guest, a friend of the channel, a guy that I absolutely love talking to. Braves Hall of Famer Leo Mazzoni. Good to see you, sir. Nice to have you. All the way from Columbus, Georgia, huh? Yes, sir. Well, Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. You know, I always like a little pub. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, you know, I, I can't thank you enough for the invite. We're, we're sitting here in, uh, in, in your man cave, as, as they call it these days. And uh, yeah. I, I got to tell you, Leo, I, I'm more than impressed with, with all the memorabilia. Well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's some of the, it just means something to me. There's, you know, I, I have three boys and they've got quite a bit of it. And, uh, but no, I, I enjoy it, but, um, you know, it, it brings back a lot of great memories and, uh, you know, you think back on it and look at all that we accomplished over that great run and, uh, uh, you, every once in a while you need to be reminded because when you, you think back on it, you go, how did we do that? You know, but, uh, I mean, I know how we did it when you have a great manager like Bobby Cox and, and then great ball players and a, and a front office that was as strong as it gets. I mean, and that's why, uh. Uh, uh, that's why we won all those ball games. I mean, no question about it. And I wouldn't trade one of those 14 straight for another World Series win. I wouldn't do it because if you think about it, every year for 14 years in a row, almost 15, that you're, you were, you had a the city of Atlanta had a ball team that was going to compete to go to the World Series every year. It's something that will <laughs> never, ever be replicated, especially with all the rule changes of today. Right. Uh, before we get into all that, though, I want to take it back uh, a while. I want to take it back to Little League days uh, and, and focus on the early, how, how you got to be where you are now and, and, and going into the Braves Hall of Fame and just your career. Uh, we were walking through uh, your home earlier. There's pictures up of you and your father in Little League and mm -hmm. the early days of you playing baseball. Early on, you know, what, what made you love the game? Well, I, I think what happened was, you know, my father was a, a sheet metal specialist on B-17 bombers in World War II. And when all the fathers came back from World War II, they all got together. Everybody had kids, right? So now there was more kids than Little League teams. So he got together with a bunch of uh, gentlemen, and, and uh, that all, they all worked at the paper mill, but they all got together and expanded the Little Leagues. And because he was playing catch with me in the backyard all the time. And I started thinking about baseball. I remember watching my first World Series was in 1957 when the Milwaukee Braves beat my loved New York Yankees. And uh, that's, that's when it all started. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, he, then he became the manager of the Little League, uh, Little League team. And, and uh, they expanded it. We played for four years in the Little League, then went to the, graduated to the Pony League and then I was in the Pony League, and then I started to stand out a little bit, you know, and uh, with and throwing throwing curveballs, heaven forbid, when I was 12 years old didn't didn't hurt. I never had a sore in my life. Anyway, um, and then it went on to semi pro, and then it went on to American Legion baseball, went on to high school baseball, and uh, and uh, when I was uh, pitching in semi pro in a team called for a team called the Kaiser Merchants in Kaiser, West Virginia, they had a first baseman there named Junie Perry. And he had played in the minor league farm system with the San Francisco Giants, and he was a bird dog for the Giants, which I didn't know. And he was the first baseman on the team that I was pitching for. And uh, he ended up getting a scout in to watch me pitch from the San Francisco Giants. And uh, But I always asked Junie, I, we called him Junie Perry, I said, Junie, I said, you know, the way you can play and the way you can hit, how come you didn't make it to the big leagues? Because, well, Leo, he said, when I was with the Giants, he said, I had two guys in front of me at first base. He said, One's name was Orlando Cepeda, and the other one was Willie McCovey. He said, that's why I didn't play in the big leagues with the Giants. Well, anyway, they saw me pitch, and they, and they signed me, and uh, I was on my way to the West Coast and up to, up to Oregon for the Northwest League. Ended up pitching 10 years in the minors, uh, six with the uh, Giants organization, four with the Oakland A's organization. Uh, got the big league camp with the world champions, champion Oakland A's. Had some great years in the minors. Uh, but anyway, after 10 years, I was in spring training with the Oakland A's. And uh, at the time, I was in AAA with the Tucson Toros. And the, 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 the farm system called me in and said they thought I was coaching material. And I said, yeah, me too, down the road. <laughs> they said, no, no, right now. I went, oh, boy, you know. So anyway, uh, I had to decide whether, you know, to, to uh, try to become a minor league free agent or take this managing job in Texas. So I took the managing job in Texas, and we won the pennant. And then that led to managing the Kinston in the Carolina League, which was a co-op team. 
So uh, the Braves optioned eight players to the Kinston and the co-op team in 1978. Five, uh, five of them were pitchers, and three of them ended up in the top ten in the league in pitching. So now the Braves want to know how come these guys were pitching, you know, in the top ten in the league in pitching, yet in our farm system with our guys, they, did, they weren't doing anything. So they, they, uh, I got a call that said, uh, uh, this is Susan Bailey. And I said, yeah, but I'm sorry, I don't know a Susan Bailey. She goes, I'm Henry Aaron's secretary. And I went, yeah. She goes, Henry would like to talk to you. I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> and he said, how would you like to fly down to Sarasota and look at our pictures? And I said, I would love to. He said, well, when can you do it? I, jokingly, I said, tomorrow. He goes, okay, we'll take care of that. I'll meet you at the airport in Atlanta. Susan will have the arrangements. And then I get on a plane with Hank Aaron and fly down to Sarasota. He offers me a job, and I said, well, what team do you want me to manage? He goes, no, 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 he wants you to be a pitching coach. And that's how my career with the Braves started. Then I was with the Braves for all those years, but my career never took off. I mean, I had good years. But then when Bobby Cox became the general manager in 1986, that's when I uh, pretty much got the juice in the farm system to, to take care of pitchers and handle them and use the programs and philosophies that I used, base, basically because I learned those philosophies from a, the greatest pitching coach for me in the history of the game, that's Johnny Sane. So that's how it all evolved. Now, it sounds rather quickly, but it was 24 years involved. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and then, then uh, after that, Bobby and I worked very close together. Uh, my pitching staffs had uh, – uh, they didn't have any sore arms. And that's, then you got to the big leagues if your pitching staffs in the minor leagues didn't break down. Now I don't know if it's – if your computer don't break down, you can get to the big leagues. But <laughs> anyway, uh, we stayed healthy, and, and uh, that got me to the big leagues with Bobby Cox. And uh, then we stayed healthy there, too, and that's why you're looking at 14 straight. For sure. Leo, what's the transition like, you know, to go from a player to a coach? I mean, in your case, rather quickly. You know, is there a difference in, in thought process? And there, I mean, you have to figure out how to explain what you've learned and yeah. what you know. I mean, what's the – is there a challenge there? No, well, of course there is. You know, you know what I had to learn? Which, which, which lineup card did the umpire get? Which part of the lineup card? Or making out the lineups, you know, stuff that you just didn't pay attention to, you know, those types of things. The baseball part of it was not hard. The baseball part of it is if you've been in the game and studied it since you were nine years old, you know, you know how to handle pitching staffs, you know how to handle players, you know how to handle certain situations, or you learn from it, that's for sure, but then you learn to deal with different personalities, and then that depends on your presentation as to how you're going to try to get the most out of them. But I think it's a uh, 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 it's not something that you lay down and plan out. It's something that you get a feel for, and then as each day evolves, you learn a little more and a little more on how to deal with people. You know, but you know when you're when you're in baseball from the time you were in high school professionally, you start you you know you meet all kinds of different people. So therefore, when your manager or coaching in the minors, you meet all kinds of different people. But uh, I never really had any problems with it. For sure. Uh... You know, you mentioned Johnny Sane, and I know you credit him for a lot of your success and your knowledge and philosophy on pitching. Is there any other mentor that you had as you as you grew into uh, being the pitching coach that you were? Uh, Johnny Sane was the pitching coach. Uh, managers Jim Beecham was a who uh, his wife is in Colum Pam's in, lives in Columbus, Georgia. We know uh, Cash pretty well. Too. Oh, Cash, yeah, boy. He's something, isn't he? Yeah. Anyway, uh, and Beach was a great, great mentor too, as far as dealing with uh, 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 the minor leagues and uh, sending us. He and I in AAA together, which AAA is kind of kind of tough because you know you call in guys to send them up, and then other guys want to know why you're not going up, and other guys want to know why they weren't called up, et cetera, et cetera. Or the guys are being sent down aren't too happy, so you got to deal with that. So. But anyway, uh, Beach was great, and Johnny Sane was great, and, and of course, Bobby Cox. I didn't have a whole lot of other mentors, as they say, uh, that taught me near as much as Sane, Beecham, and Cox. I mean, I don't think anybody else comes close. So you, you Bobby Cox becomes general manager in 1986. That's You, you mentioned that's when you really got the juices flowing right. uh, with the minor leagues. Uh, you, you took the reins over in 1990, and that, that's when you're, I, I think, your true, you know, the, the best years, I think, came. I mean, 1991, we go worst to first, mm -hmm. all that stuff. You come in and you, you find a, a young John Smoltz and a young Tom Glavin. Mm -hmm. When did you know uh, 
you know, the potential they had? When did you think these both of these guys could be something? Well, you, you, I, had, I had Smoltz in the minor league, so I knew that Smoltz was going to, you know, it, it, just as soon as he got his head on straight, he was going to be outstanding. Glavin was a stoic figure that uh, – I got to know a little bit when he was signed, and, and he was in the instructional league with myself and Johnny Sane. So I knew Tommy was a tough kid. He just needed a defense behind him, you know. So it wasn't that difficult. I mean, as far as you knew, they were going to be good, but you had to have to surround. You had to surround them with something, you know. You nobody could catch the ball. The infield in uh, in Fulton County Stadium was brutal, you know. As far as the uh, it was lightning fast, and they called the place the launching pad. So you know, therefore. Uh, uh, you had to give them a chance. So what happened was the Braves went out and got the defense. Sherholtz comes in, changes the whole defense around. You know, therefore Smolsey tr- starts to mature. Uh, Tom Glavin is, is starts to to uh, you know not doesn't worry about contact as much anymore. Uh, you know, you had uh, Pete Smith, Steve Avery, young left-hander, and then a veteran like Charlie Liebrandt, uh who held the fort was kind of a mentor to those guys too, you know, as far as being a veteran. And you put all that together, but, um, you know, I'll find something interesting. At the end of the 90 season, Bobby Cox told me, he says, get your five starters out in the bullpen. I mean, out in the dugout before everybody gets here around 2 o'clock. So we get Avery, Smoltz, Glavin, Pete Smith, and Charlie Liebrandt. He calls them out, and because we already knew something was cooking, you know, as far as they were going to be pretty good. And he calls them out, and he says, when we go to spring training next year, guys, he goes, you're the starting rotation. I don't care what happens in spring training. I don't care runs, hits, all that. You five guys are going to start every game in spring training, and, and you're, you five are going to start still however far it takes us. He said, so be mentally prepared to do that. And they took us to the seventh game of the World Series. Yeah, and, and and 91, I think, is so fondly remembered because that was the start. That was the start of the 14th straight, mm-hmm. and it was the start of what I, I think we consider to be, you know, the 90s Braves, obviously. That was, right. you know, the, the, the sign of change. Right. Talk to me through that year because I know, like, last year the Braves had a lot of challenges. Fans, you know, at, at the trade deadline were yeah. were, were aggravated, and, and obviously that you're going to have challenges every year. But that one especially, for, to go worse to first like the Braves were able to do and, and to go to uh, the World Series, what was the – I mean, the, was there a change halfway through the season? Was there a moment that – Well, know, it, yeah, it was the all-star break. But before you get to that, remember, Ronnie Gant, David Justice, Mark Lemke – uh, those guys played on – they were winners in the minors. You know, it isn't just like they got to the big leagues, they were winners. They won in double-A. They won in triple-A. We won the Governor's Cup in triple-A. We went to the playoffs in double-A and, and with Greenville and got beat in the playoffs, but we were in the playoffs. You know, they were, they were winners from the time they signed. So they knew what it was like to win, and they didn't like to lose, you know. And uh, I think when you're getting that losing mentality, you, you know, you kind of – and that's what the Braves were at for about. They lost 100 games for a few years in a row there. But uh, they changed the mentality of it. Of course, now when you got a leadership in the dugout with Bobby and then leadership up top in the front office, I mean, that changes the whole thing. Then you acquire somebody like Terry Pendleton or Sid Bream or Otis Nixon and Ralphie, you know, the whole thing. And so we knew it a week after the All-Star break. I think we got on a winning streak and uh, – was it the Cardinals that lost five, seven or eight in a row? Mm-hmm. And we won seven or eight in a row, and all of a sudden we're only four games back. And then uh, the Do- and the Dodgers – are we – no, I'm sorry. We swept the Cardinals. Yeah. And then the Dodgers lost. So now we, we close within four of the Dodgers. And then uh, we hung around, and then all of a sudden Lasorda was saying, well, we need to get the Braves off our back. They're hanging around too long. They'll, they'll, they'll fade away. You know, and uh, naturally we got into a great pennant race uh, – with the Dodgers, and uh, it was, went down to the last day. You you mentioned him, and I, I I've met him and, and got to know him a little bit. Terry Pendleton, mm-hmm. w- when he was brought in, how how much of a leader was he? Well, TP right away was a leader. You know, he'd call guys in privately, even some of the the players, and say, "Look, you know, you, you know, you, this is your this is your uh, uh, mental approach, etc." And Terry'd come from winners in St. Louis, so Terry uh, he, and he led by example, that's for sure. But he also quietly. Uh, got some points across without anybody knowing about it. You know what I mean? 
I, I like Terry a lot. I mean, former MVP we're talking about, Terry yeah. Pendleton. Uh, moving past 91, a uh, couple of world back-to-back World Series appearances. 93 comes along, and a guy named Greg Maddox is on the way. Mm-hmm. What, you're the pitching coach. When you find out that the reigning Cy Young Award winner's on the way, I mean, how, how giddy are you knowing of his arrival? Well, I, 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 think, I think that what happened was this. We had meetings in Atlanta, and uh, Ted Turner said we had one big bullet to shoot, and it was either Bonds or Maddox. And um, so they're going around the table, you know, and everything. And, they, of course, they said, what do you think, Leo? I said, well, what do you think I think? I'm a pitching coach. Who do you think I'm going to pick? You know? And so it, it was split down the middle 50-50. But Bobby Cox told, said at the he was the last one. He, you know, he says, if we had – he said, with the great rotation that we already have, he said, if we had Greg Maddox into that rotation, he says, we'll never have a losing streak. He was right. Yeah. And so, anyway, uh, uh, you know, we signed Maddox. And uh, I think the greatest free agent sign in the history of the game, to be honest with you, because now, you, now you're – for 10, 11 years – uh, you're part of you know you have a rotation intact that uh, uh, with a base and f- a few nice ones around it that uh, accomplished a great deal. Well, come on, they're all in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And then here's what you forget though: yeah, you you, Steve Avery was good, and and Pete Smith was good, and Kevin Millwood was good, and Danny Nagel was good, and John Burkett, Jarrett Wright, and the list goes on and on and on. And then you had bullpen guys that were good, uh, you know. You know, whoever thought Kerry Leitenberg would save 30-some games, and he did. And uh, But we had uh, some different closers, but you had Greg McMichael, change-up guys, save games. You know, Wohlers was a power guy. Rocker was a power guy. Smolsey was lights out. Uh, and But Alejandro Pena, you yeah. know, I mean, all of them elevated their game, and I think a lot of that had to do with the atmosphere created uh, by the manager. Well, we can't talk about the 90s without talking about the pinnacle of it, 1995. Braves win the World Series. I'm sure that's, you know, one, one of the best moments uh, that you're looking yeah. back on in your career. What did, I mean, just walk me through the feeling of that. Walk me, I mean, Dave Justice hits the homer right. amid, amidst all the, you know, uh, extracurricular things that were going on at that time. You know, what's going through your mind? When, when that run was scored, how confident were you finishing that game? I wish we could few, score a few more is what I was thinking. But, you know, that Cleveland lineup was just devastating. I mean, I mean, when you have Jim Tomey and Manny Ramirez hitting at the bottom end of the lineup, come on. And uh, But, no, Tommy was uh, on his game. Uh, he came in the dugout after the fifth inning and said, somebody score a run because they're not. And uh, so, anyway, uh, that was very unusual for Glab to say something like that. And I told Bobby, I said, Bobby, you here? They goes, yeah, we need to get a run. And uh, – but no, uh, it was. I, it's got to be the greatest game pitched in the history of the Braves, for the the environment, what it accomplished, everything else. We had so many great pitch games in our lifetime, Smoltzy and Maddox, all of them. I mean, they all pitched great, and uh, and every day was a you know was a fight for the for a pennant. It wasn't just showing up at the ballpark and playing a ball game, and uh, but it, you know it was a great feeling. You you you, you know I. I didn't uh, scream and holler and all that kind of stuff, you know. I was just, uh, just uh, you know, s- totally satisfied, you know, and thinking, you know, we were there '91, we lost, but you know, you lose, you you get to the World Series and you lose it, knowing that you didn't give nothing away, you know. The other teams are pretty good too, uh, but and I saw uh, Eddie Murray in Cooperstown when the, all the guys were being put in the Hall of Fame. And I said, hey, Eddie, how you doing? He goes, go blank yourself, Mazzoni. <laughs> and I said, are you still mad about the 95 World Series? He goes, yeah. I said, well, what are you mad about? He goes, I told the lineup that the Braves pitchers were going to go strike one down and away, and then you're never going to see another strike, so don't swing. He says, and we swung, you know. So, but, you know, th- th- those are the things that uh, that you remember most, uh, uh being a part of that is uh, just a tremendous feeling of satisfaction and uh, it makes all those days in the minors and everything that you, you know, we earned every bit of it, that's for sure. And, uh, but then to uh, realize all your childhood dreams, that's what, when you win a World Series or you're in the World Series or in an all-star game, your childhood dreams are right there staring you in the face. Well, I mean, obviously that's that's one of the I mean keystone moments in the history of the franchise. Uh, but the, the long stretch of success, fourteen right. years of, of success, right. can't be overlooked. And I think that tends to happen in a lot of, in a lot of 
you know, different conversations. I, I want to ask you, the Braves won 14 straight division titles. And when you say 14, I think a lot of people forget how hard it is to win <laughs> one. One. I'd like you to tell us just, just how hard it is. Well, you know, you're, you're not thinking about it at the time. You start every year thinking, if we don't get to the World Series and win it, you know. And But you know what? It, it's it's like some of the guys used to say, so we know we're going to be in the world. We, we know we're going to be in the postseason. You know, that's only a matter, of, you know, of, of playing the games. And that, that's how confident everybody was. Not cocky. We had a saying we were going to quietly stick it to somebody and leave. Nobody's even going to know we were there. And uh, that's how we pitched. And, uh, but every year was a different year. So you never thought about, well, how many straight we got here? That, that never in your mind. You went to the ballpark every day. That was the thing that entered your mind. That game, that day. They only, you know, the one World Series I think we were better and lost was uh, in 96, we were better than the Yankees and got beat. Uh, but other than that, every, I think all the other ones pretty much ran true to form, you know, as far as wins and winners and losers. But that 96 team, was a great team, and uh, uh, I thought we were better than the Yankees, but it didn't didn't fall our way. So, but um, you know, you you don't think about all that stuff till you're done, and then you don't think about anything that's going on that year till the year's over, because you're so locked in on each game and you play so many games that uh, uh, you don't have time to think about any of that other stuff. All I cared about was our starting pitchers making our starts. That's all I cared about because I knew if that happened. We were going to be there at the end. It's funny you say that. Uh, my next question is actually, you know, it, the Braves, even in recent memory, have always been built on pitching. Every time we load up on prospects or, or, mm -hmm. or you know, we have a new influx of talent, it's always pitching. How much does that, you know, impact success in your opinion? How much does that, the way they build themselves as a team, how much does that contribute? Well, it contributes a lot because, you know what, there's a saying, they say, oh, you ever hear that you go on these shows, he goes, oh, what's the key to the game tonight? Well, there's only one key. You know what that is? You're only as good as tonight's starting pitcher. You're only – and you could, and so there is no other keys. You can, you can stay, talk all that stuff you want, you know. Well, this guy's this, – this, he hits this against this guy. And that's nice to find out, and the fans need to know that information. But when it comes right down to it, you're only as good as tonight's starting pitcher. Now, that's what it used to be. Now, depending on how long you plan on using your starting pitcher – you know, I because I personally believe that uh, you got about 20 good starting pitchers in the entire big leagues, and the rest of those starters are long relievers. Well, I want to ask you, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know you're a very strongly opinionated man. You have the right to be. Uh, th there's been a lot of changes uh, in the game recently. Uh, you know, we all know what they are. The universal DH is, is one of the biggest ones, a runner on second base and extra right, innings, right, right. all that stuff. Um, but – in your opinion, how much of that is actually – and I know what your answer is going to be, but how much of that is actually benefiting the game, if any? Um, well, you know, when you start the runner on second in the extra innings, I mean, coach-wise, strategy-wise, you look at it and you go, well, let's see, should I bunt him over? Should we, you know, you, you did it, uh, uh, you know, you, there's different types of ways to go about getting that run in from second base. You know, so I think that's strategy-wise, that's not bad. Uh, but bringing a reliever in and he has to face three hitters, that stinks. What if he walks the first two? You know, what if he doesn't have it? You know, that's terrible. I don't like that rule at all. And believe me, the extra inning thing is, why do you think there's, you know, they call it time of the game? That ain't why they're using that on that extra innings. They're using it so they don't have to use so many pitchers in an extra inning ball game. You know, because how many times when I was coaching, we had an extra inning game, and it kept going and going. And we had to, the, the 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 only guy left was the starting pitcher from the that was going to pitch the next day. But we were going to use them anyway if it meant winning the ball game. Then we would spot start somebody the next day. Now all that is is just so they don't have to use so many pitchers, which is totally ridiculous. And what's totally ridiculous is using using an average of fifty one players a year in the big leagues on each team was the average was fifty one players. You know that's. That's that's crazy. That's totally ridiculous. And uh, so uh, that's why these rules are being implemented. This time of the game thing, I don't think it has anything to do with anything. You I know? mean, it also hasn't cut down on it on, no. on a major scale. No. You know, you're not seeing anything major. No. Oh, well, you know, the pitcher has to throw the ball in 20, 25 seconds, whatever. I don't even know what it is. I don't pay attention to it. Or, you know, uh, uh, now they're experimenting in the minor leagues with bigger bases, automated ump strike zones. I think that's a terrible. 
I, I wanted to. Ask oh, I think you, that's awful. I I wanted to ask you what you thought about it, and I wanted to bring up one game specifically. Uh, it, the Eric Gregg game, nineteen ninety seven yeah. NLCS. I remember that. Do Do you wish that it had there had been an electronic strike zone in that regard? Just Just due to the. No, no, you guys, because you know, at the time nobody even thought about it. It's just that uh, he had a bad game, and uh, God rest his soul, he's a good umpire. But he was calling everything. Those backdoor curveballs were a foot out that Chipper Jones and Fred McGriff could not reach. And he was calling them strikes. So, you know, uh, you know, when umpires used to say on a getaway day, you know, out on the West Coast, they were going home or whatever, and they'd say on a Sunday day game, come on, boys, swing the bats. They're, they're looking in the dugout, stuff, swing the bats. That means they're going to call a lot of strikes. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, oh, no, we got to have it perfect. You know, you got to, you know, I, sw- I watched a couple games the other night and I thought the strike zone stunk. And I think most of the strike zones stink because, uh, you know, they're trying to get everybody to call pitches north and south instead of east and west. And now all of a sudden you watch the game and the hitter, every time a hitter gets a called strike on him, he's stepping out of the box and staring around like, well, well how can you call that on me? You know, or this or that. And they're, they're, they're easy strikes, easy strikes. The game has changed, and uh, I still love it and still watch it, but the game has changed, and it's um, it's not the same anymore. And I think if we're not careful, the analytics are going to ruin it. Well, the analytics have certainly taken over. I mean, you're, you're to me, it's a two option game because it's either a home run or a strikeout these right. days. And I, I think we're in, you know, with that, you, you have to bring up the shift idea, banning mm-hmm. the shift. What are your thoughts on that? Teach somebody to hit against the shift. I mean, you know, it's not that hard to go opposite field, you know. And the other thing, you know, I mean, and to me, you know, I talked to a minor league hitting instructor one time, not the Braves minor league hitting instructor, but one of the ones in another organization that I know. And I said, don't you guys in the minor leagues teach them how to hit the ball the other way? You know, you can, you can hit 400 against the shift. No, they don't want us messing with their swing. I went, oh, come on, you know. When I was growing up, you taught people to hit, gap, hit the gaps, What's wrong with hitting an opposite field gap? You know, that's an extra base hit. Or I love Freddie Freeman did it a lot. He goes, yeah. goes down the left field line, which I love, you know. So, therefore, uh, there's ways to beat the, a shift, you know. But if everybody wants strikeouts and home runs, then that's what you're seeing. And then you're seeing pitchers that is, they, they just rear back and fire as hard as they can. And, you know, you're seeing pitchers being taken out with no hitters, taken out with third time around the lineup. What a – Silly, you know. I could see us going out and telling one of our guys, hey, you're coming out, you know, this is the third time around the lineup. They're going to say, we ain't coming out. I'm going to tell you that. And I can't stand it if I see somebody, pitcher, being taken out of a game after four or five innings or six. He's got a great game going, and they take him out, and he's just happy as can be on the bench. I would be so – if I was pitching or some of the pitchers that I knew – they would be so angry in that dugout, they'd be tearing that thing all over, over, tearing it up all over the place. But now, that's the way they're taught, that's the way they're brought up, and that's what you're going to get. Well, there, there's a guy that I, I really specifically want to mention because I've done a lot of talking about him. He's a guy that's sort of taken uh, the Braves bullpen by storm this year. His name is Spencer Strider. Uh, he's a draft pick we picked up a couple years ago. Uh, got a great fastball, uh, not a lot of secondary pitches. Uh, because of, he's had great success in long relief, we're talking three, four innings in relief uh, on you know multiple games now. A lot of people want him to move to a starter, but with a guy like that who has two pitches, maybe three, how successful can they be as a starter? If you got two going, you're going to win. If you got three going, you're going to throw a shutout. And if you get narrowed down to one, you're going to lose. So therefore, he could be. Okay. Absolutely. You know, you, you're talking about Hall of Fame pitchers that go into the Hall of Fame with three pitches. You know, and and if you're talking about uh, a guy that you know that can pitch multiple innings and has more than one pitch and and and, and if you got we used to have that saying if you got two going you're going to win if you got three going you're going to throw a shutout and if you're narrowed down to one you're going to lose so yes you could do it that's great advice and the Braves have a lot of young talent a guy named Kyle Wright's done great things this Looked year real good this year yeah he, he's been outstanding uh how much of that do you think is confidence alone it is confidence I mean you when it, when a pitcher finally a, understands that he belongs there that he you know he's not just hoping to stay there but that he belongs there you know Steve Avery had a rough go in his in in uh in 90 you know when he when we brought him up he had a t- tough time in 91 he was what in, in MVP of the NLCS 
Well, that's because he realized that he belonged there and he was going to get the opportunity. We handed him the ball every fourth or fifth day. So therefore, he realized he belonged there and then he took it, he took it the rest of the way. You know, so that's what it is. It is confidence belonging. And, and then once you've realized that you belong there, all of a sudden command improves. Yes. And when command improves and pitches get better, then you're going you're gonna to have more success. And this young kid is, uh, is, is having some success. And, uh, you know, and you've got to realize that if you have a couple of difficult outings, that doesn't mean you've got to change the rotation. That doesn't mean you've got to change pitchers. That means sometimes that happens. But, you know, what – what do you think would have happened to John Smoltz if he was pitching now in today's game and at the All-Star break he was 2-12? and 12? They would have probably sent him down. Or they'd have probably sent him down before that. Or what Bobby Cox say, best 2-12 and 12 pitcher ever seen, handed him the ball every fifth day, and what happens? That's the, reason, that's the main reason why he's going in the Hall of Fame because Bobby didn't take him out of the rotation. And there was people that wanted to, but he didn't take him out. He handed him the ball. Smoltzy turned it around. So you can't keep switching pitchers every time somebody has a difficult outing. You got to ride them out, completely. and then they'll get better. I completely agree. And Kyle Wright, you know, I mentioned that, that he had a great appearance in the World Series last mm-hmm. year, and there was a lot of big moments in the World Series last year. I'm, I'm sure it was, you know, it was great for for Braves fans to watch. It was great for the team. Uh, sort of came out of nowhere last year. Great run, great trade deadline, great, you know, mm-hmm. just second half. Uh, I, I wanted to highlight some key moments out of the postseason and just get your opinion on it, uh, focused on the pitchers. Number one being uh, the way the bullpen came together just in the second half. Mm-hmm. Is there a, something that clicks? Is there something that, you know, just all of a sudden makes you gel together like, like they were yeah, able they to beca- do? Yeah, they, 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 you know, there's some crazy stuff goes out there in that bullpen. You know, you get, but you, get, you end up getting a three-headed monster, right? And, uh, you know, like the Nasty Boys and uh, those types of guys, you know, they're – and, and so – you know, they, they start feeding off each other, and that's what happens. You know, you start feeding off each other. You pick me up, I'll pick you up. You pick me up, I'll pick you up, you know. And uh, then, they, then, then you go out, and instead of talking it, they, they do it. Yeah, but that, I've seen that happen a lot with bullpens. Uh, what I don't like about bullpens now is that they're only good for a year or so because I think, I think we end up ruining bullpens, not we, as the I mean the Braves, I mean baseball in general. Bullpens change over now so much because they're, they're, they're being used so much and they're being, I think the setup guys are being abused a little too much. So, uh, but uh, that's what happens. I mean, uh, uh, you bond together and you, you know, you have something cooking down there that's going on. It's like, like Smolsey, you know, when he became a reliever, you know, he turned one of the, a part of the bullpen into a TV with a lounge chair and everything. But they all loved it. It became part of their, part of their thing, you know. So, uh, and you love that kind of thing, and you love to see it happen. And uh, but there was a, it was three three tough guys that uh, that that carried a load. Uh, I want to highlight one of those guys, Tyler Matzik. Uh, when, when he came in and struck out three in a row, right. with, with runners in scoring position, right. I mean that. T- well, it yeah. reminded me of Mark Wollers, you know. I mean, Wollers was the one guy that could come in and strike out the side with with men on base. And uh, uh, Alejandro Pena was pretty good at that, too, at times. <clears throat> but um, in in order to do that, you I mean, number one, you have to have good stuff. But number two, got to locate. And uh, uh, I think number one, you have to – let me rephrase that. <laughs> number one, you have to locate the good stuff. And uh, plus, you know, you, you, you're, you, when you get like that, you're in attack mode. But you always tell pitchers this: you can, you work hard, but if you don't work smart, it doesn't do you any good. And he worked smart. Well, there was a guy that worked really hard uh, for the for the Braves last year, Charlie Morton, in the World yeah. Series game one. Uh, breaks his leg, stays on the mound. I I, I guess right. breaks it on that last pitch. Uh, yeah. Worse. Well, I mean, I've never talked to him personally, but uh, I love to watch him pitch. Uh, uh, I think that uh, Charlie's got uh, you know top flight stuff, and uh, you know, and he just looks like he you know uh, a guy that uh, somebody like Max Fried can go to and talk to, you know, or Kyle Wright can go yeah. to and talk to, or uh, uh, Ian Anderson can go to and talk to, and uh, you know, you're you're talking about some pretty good pitchers right there. And uh, to be honest with you, if if I had uh, Ian Anderson, Max Fried, Kyle Wright. Charlie Morton, who am I leaving out? Anybody? I would be telling him this. 
Each one of you are going to pitch 200 innings. And if you do, we'll be back in the World Series. That would be our goal. You're going to pitch 200 innings. And I guarantee you they could do it. Uh, you mentioned you kind of uh, hinted at this earlier. I want to I want to focus on it a little bit more. You were really good about keeping injuries uh, from happening. Mm-hmm. How many Tommy Johns uh, were, did the Braves have? Well, you had Smoltzy and uh, and Kerry Lightenberg homegrown, but other than that, I don't I can't. So two. Um, mm-hmm. right, right now, they, I mean, they happen all the time in baseball. Right. For for the Braves, uh, you know, Luke Jackson got Tommy John at, at the beginning of the year in spring training. Tyler Matzik now has shoulder inflammation. And, oh, of course. You know, you, you can blame that a little bit on last year. Maybe it was overworked throughout the I, I No, I, th- I think where it all starts is travel baseball. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think now that uh, uh, kids are throwing, uh, they're all encouraged to see how hard they can throw, and we never cared about how hard somebody threw. We were always basing our philosophy on more often with less exertion. Uh, you, you know, you could, you could tell a hitter, I'd go to a pitch and say, you know you can get a guy out five ways. Stuff, movement, location. Uh, change of speeds and motion. Now, not necessarily in that order. If I had to pick one, it's location. Okay? But if you got five ways to get a hitter out, and then we wanted to be sneaky quick as opposed to overpowering. And we wanted, And Hank Aaron told me when I was a young pitching coach, he said, Leo, you make sure you tell your pitchers this. He says, we can time a jet coming through that strike zone if we see it often enough. So, therefore, I re, you know, that, and what was Johnny saying a great teacher of? change in speeds so therefore i've got aaron telling me this and saying telling me this now let's see who's had success in this game huh give me a break if you don't want to listen to that and uh so anyway uh, uh so we based all we threw a lot you know I, I had guys throw extra extra days in the bullpen i mean as far as in between starts i wanted them to throw as much as they wanted to never discourage the guy from throwing if the relievers didn't warm up or get in the game for a couple of days, I had them come down and throw before a game. I had one executive tell me one time, what are you doing warming up a re- reliever before the game? I said, I wasn't warming him up. I said, we were having a little side session. He goes, well, what if he gets in the game tonight? I said, that's what we're preparing for, <laughs> getting him ready to pitch in the game because he hadn't pitched for three or four days. So don't you think he might be a little sharper? And uh, things like that nature, which I don't know if that enters, ever enters anybody's mind now or not. But I think travel baseball with the – Kids being encouraged to throw so hard, and all the emphasis on 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 how hard you throw, what how, well you know always he's at my son's at seventy eight now and eighty eight are the you know what can he pitch, and if you're encouraging him to see how hard he can throw, uh, then I think you're raising the risk of uh, of uh, Tommy John surgeries, and I know that there's a big percentage now are under twenty one years of age. Well, to give you a good example, was somebody was drafted by in the major leagues last year. It was a pitcher from Vanderbilt, and they didn't sign him because they checked his arm out or something. It was a big star pitcher for Vanderbilt, and they checked his arm out, and his elbow wasn't. And I think that all starts with how how teenagers are being taught to pitch. And look, you 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 can rest guys all you want. It's not going to do any good, you know. If they're still going to come out and throw as hard as they can for as long as they can, and then just you know, as 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 Greg Maddox used to call them, brain dead heavers. You know, to where a guy just goes out there blind and throws the heck out of the ball and with no clue, with poor mechanics, no touch, you're going to get hurt. Bottom line. Well, Leo, I, I've always appreciated the fact you, you take your time to go uh, I, basically spread that message to, right. to kids in travel ball, to kids, uh, to youth that are starting in the game. And, and I think it really says a lot about you. And, and, and obviously, you know better than anybody or you know better than a lot of other people. Right. Just the damage it can do. Uh, what well, you would know your the sad part is, I can read coaches' faces and some man and, and parents' faces, and I don't think they believe me. Not all of them, but some of them. I can read their faces and say, "Ah, well, we ain't doing that." Okay. Well, I'm going to give you a free platform. If there's a kid watching that uh, you know that has that mindset or hears it from a coach, what would you tell them? I tell them, let it go in one ear and out the other, but be polite about it. And then after they pitch good, say, boy, coach, what a great idea you had. That's how it goes. <laughs> you heard it here first, guys. You know, and let it go in one ear and out the other, you know. And how about the pitch counts, right? Oh, my. You know, what? here's what nobody realizes. Bobby Cox had a max out inning count, you know. A max out. And everybody go, and so I talked to a lot of people about it. I bet there's people in the big leagues that don't even 
know about it, you know, and uh, not, the Braves organization does, but not uh, other organizations. So if a pitcher, he'd Bobby say, is he going to max out this, this inning, Leo? I say, yeah, he's going to max out his effort. That means after this inning, he's done. Pitch count has nothing to do with it. And if he's not, I said, no, he's still on cruise. He's pretty good. He goes, well, then we ain't taking him out. And pitch count has nothing to do with it. Okay? Here's the other thing, too, is, is you know, why wouldn't somebody teach a, a young pitcher that the most vulnerable count a hitter can have is no balls and two strikes? And why don't you just go ahead and try to take him out immediately? You know, why not? We used to say every pitch that we throw, every pitch that we pitch, is to get the guy out. We ain't setting him up over here. We ain't doing this over here. We ain't doing this setup, show, waste, all that stuff. Not in our terminology. Every pitch you decide to throw is to get the guy out. Period. Now, I'd tell the pitchers, now look, you know, you're going to give up an 0-2 hit. You're going to hear it from somebody, you know. So you're going to have to be thick-skinned and let it go in one ear and out the other. I said, because ain't nobody going to say nothing to you when you go deep into a game in a very efficient way. That's how you throw a 76-pitch game right there. Uh, I want to I want to highlight this, too, because I think, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about the change in the game, and this is something that has, has plagued uh, the Braves in a way uh, for the past couple of years. It's a, I guess, unwritten rule. Uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. has been – plunked by the Marlins six times. Yeah, too much. Too, too much. Three times on the first pitch of the game. Uh, you know, the game's changed. You, you've seen a lot of baseball in your day, Leo. Right. How would you, uh, out of pure curiosity, how would you and Bobby have handled that situation? That's why we ain't there no more. <laughs> that perfect. answer your question? That's perfect. That's why we ain't there no more. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, I don't believe in showing up the opposition or, uh, you know, that's not what they're doing now, I guess. Apparently, they, they do something else. But, uh, you know, I can't imagine Goose Gossage out there on the mound and <laughs> somebody doing that with Goose Gossage out there pitching. Boy, he's going to get you. Somebody's going to get it in the ear hole. But, look, this is part of the game now. So, that's acceptable. And, uh, uh, you know, you have to ch- – you know, the modern-day player managers and coaches, I think they don't have any choice to accept the fact that uh, change, uh, it, there's change. You know, there's, there's a, uh, you change with, you adapt to changing times and changing athletes. And uh, that's, what, that's what coaches do now. And uh, that's what managers do now. And uh, so, therefore, uh, that's part of it. I don't particularly care for it, but I don't have to worry about it anymore. So I ain't going to worry about it. I just hope the Braves win, you know. <laughs> But you know what? If you when you're good, you're there's a fine line there somewhere. You know, I remember uh, one time a uh, uh, hitter from the Mets. You know, he hit a home run off Ave and uh, started dancing around the bases and waving in his dugout. And well, we look, we never saw much of that, right? Next time up, Ave hit him in the kneecap and said, "Dance around the bases now." You know, <laughs> and uh, so you know all these. You know, I, I don't like everybody pointing to themselves or. Somebody like cussing and raising cane, running around the bases and uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, I don't like any of that. You know, I think that there's a, there's a way to act professionally, and uh, you know, and that's the way I am, and that's the way we played, and that's the way our our pitchers never stared nobody down. You know, and and we led the league in least amount of hit batsmen for twelve years in a row, but not because we didn't want to hit anybody. It was because if you can't get somebody out and you drill them because you can't get them out, then it's our job not to do that but to make better pitches to get them out. Now, if somebody's showing you up or somebody wiped out your middle infielders or somebody bowled over your – I mean, you know, went out of their way to take somebody out, then possibly we could – you would, we, you would uh, send a message back. But that, that only comes from one person and one person only from the manager because Bobby told me when I got there don't you ever tell a pitcher to hit somebody he said that thing will come from me and me only and it's not going to be very often Leo I got to ask you because you were you were with the master of this did you ever get ejected in a major league baseball game yeah I got ejected Bobby told me to though (laughs) and it was Angel Hernandez of all people did that answer your question I don't think we did 
Well, Glavin, we're pitching on the game in Arizona, and Tommy Glavin starts the game, and it's strike one on the outside corner. Glavin, he called, Angel goes, ball. Glavin kind of stared in, and Angel jumps up and throws his mask off and says, there are no corners today. Well, as soon as Bobby heard that, he went crazy. He was going on the first pitch of the game. You cannot do that to a, to a, uh, uh, an umpire, you know. I mean, to a to a player, umpire should not do that, you know. And uh, but the only, you know, that was it. I mean, that wasn't allowed. I wasn't allowed to do that either. You that there's there was a big, a tremendous chain of command there, and make no mistake about it. Bobby Cox was the leader of this chain of command in the dugout. Okay, and uh, I kind of slid in by him. You know what I mean? Behind him and. Uh, but, you know, there were certain things. But I'll never forget the genius of Bobby Cox my first year with him. And, uh, uh, you know, we're in the fifth inning of a close ball game. And he, he said, Leo, he said, put your thinking cap on. I went, well, what's going on? He goes, in the seventh inning, the pitcher could come up with the bases loaded and two outs. We have to decide to pinch hit or not. And I'm going, all right. I'm going, damn, that's seventh inning. This is only the fifth. And I'm, already, I'm just locked in on the fifth, right? He's already thinking the pitcher. He, he, he's 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 going through all these scenarios in his mind, and I went, I'm in a different league here, you know. By that I mean being with a manager like that, you know. And uh, he actually made my job uh, a lot easier yeah, because he was a tremendous handler of pitchers. And the re- what separates him from all the managers in the Hall of Fame is that nobody handled pitching staffs like Bobby Cox. And to this day, every pitcher will tell you that, that they love going through a brick wall for him, you know. And so did his – but so did his players. Players, pitchers, we had it all. You know, we had, you know, great players, great pitchers, great leadership from top to bottom. Chain of command was never broken. But the bottom line is this. I've never even heard of a good a pitching coach didn't think was a great pitching coach unless you had talent. <laughs> we wouldn't be sitting here talking right now about what we're talking about if we didn't have talent. And that's where it all starts because the late, great John Wooden from UCLA, right? Basketball, he goes, what do you credit to your success? He goes, talent, talent, and more talent. Well, you, you mentioned it, so I, I want to take a second to really talk about Bobby Cox. I mean, you, you spent a lot of years with him, uh, and I know you, you guys keep a relationship to this day. Mm-hmm. What does he mean to you? Well, I mean, besides my father, the biggest influence on my life than any man in my lifetime, so... No question about it. And a great man. Uh, he, and everybody says, well, wh- how does he do it? You can, he has stuff that you can't teach. You, know, you just can't go, well, he teach, you know, he do this, do this, do this. He, had, you know, you, he, he was born with that, and w- with that leadership quality. And there's just stuff that you can't teach. But he understands people. He understands the pressures of what major league players go through. You know, he understands... Uh, 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 you know, like going down to spring training, you know, what's the big deal? We're going to get in baseball shape, you know, pitchers do in a little running, run the bases, uh, ground balls, fly balls, batting practice, hit none of this crazy stuff. You have to get in baseball shape. And, uh, you know, and so now I think I, you want to hear something crazy. I mean, these guys are in such great shape now. They like keep pulling and tearing everything, you know, <laughs> Lou Pinella said the guys are in too good a shape now. <laughs> but, you know, there's something to that, you know, uh, uh, that you get in baseball shape, you know. And that's what Maddox loved. Maddox loved the Braves because there weren't any gimmicks. And there, you know what eyewash is? There wasn't any eyewash. Eyewash means that you're just doing a bunch of stuff on the field that means nothing to please the front office. It's called eyewash, you know. Or you didn't have – you didn't have coaches that were – you never heard them, heard them say anything until somebody from the front office appeared down on the field, didn't you? You heard their mouth all over the place. Because a wise man told me one time that when you're doing your job, it looks like you're hardly working. That's great advice. That is great and advice. Bobby taught us all that. That's great advice. I, I want to throw some other names at you. Uh, I know I've kept you for a while, but uh, I've enjoyed every minute of it. But I want to throw some some more names at you. you. You can give me a thought. You can give me a memory, uh, a- anything like that. Um, num- number one, w- once again, just Hank Aaron. Oh, great boss. He's my boss for 12 years in the minor leagues. You know what I loved about Hank? He said, there's your pitchers. He said, take care of them. He said, I don't care how you do it. He said, that's what I hired you for. 
So nobody ever told me how to take care of pitchers. And you know what? Bobby Cox told me the same thing when I got to Atlanta. There's your pitchers. Take care of them. And, uh, uh, and so Hank was great. You know, I mean, he let you do your job. And one time I said, I hadn't, he hadn't, I hadn't heard from him for about two or three months. And I said, oh, my, I mean, he must be mad at me or something. You know, I ain't heard. You know, so I called him up. I said, Hank, is everything okay? Everything? Because I was an insecure young pitching coach, right? And uh, he said, I said, everything okay? He goes, Leo, he said, if I had to call you much, he said, that wouldn't be good. He said, if you don't hear from me, that means you're doing your job. Everything's perfectly fine. So then after that, I didn't care whether he called me or not. I mean, I mean, yeah, just, I mean, obviously a great player. We all, we're all very aware of that and a, and a great man as well. Yes, uh, very, uh, hum- very humble. You would never know that he was a home run king. You, you would never know it. We used to be at Okeechobee Steakhouse and be in a corner. He did me and I go. He and I'd go have dinner. And he go, Leo. He said, "Would you go up to the bar and get me a glass of wine and bring it back?" He said, "Because if I get up to that bar to get a glass of wine, he said, I'll never get back to the table." <laughs> it's probably right. Yeah. Uh, the the next guy is a guy who 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 I've interviewed. Actually, I I got to know him pretty well, and I, and I know you did too, Phil Necro. Oh, Nuxie was great, funny. Yeah. A funny man. He had a joke for everything, you know, and. And, uh, uh, of course, everybody used to say, well, Mazzoni, how do you teach a knuckleball? I said, well, I don't teach a knuckleball, and I can't teach a knuckleball. I said, but I'll tell you one thing. If I'm one to teach, learn how to throw a knuckleball, you go find Phil Necro, you'll find out how to throw a knuckleball. Great, great sense of humor. Nuxie's a great guy. He always, it, Even when I was in the minor leagues and he was in the big leagues, he made you feel comfortable if you were in the big league camp, just like you were one of the guys. I can speak to that, you know. I, I when he met me, I, I was I was you know a kid, and he he made me feel the exact same mm-hmm. way. I completely agree with you. Uh, the next guy is Don Sutton. Don Sutton, one of the smartest individuals I ever met in my life, as far as talking pitching. Uh, I actually asked Don Sutton to come down and watch bullpen sessions with Steve Avery and Kevin Millwood, because he says you really want me to come down and watch him. I said. Why wouldn't I want a 300-game winner to come down and watch our guys throw? Because you may see something that I'm not that I'm not getting through to him on, and he loved that. You know, why not take advantage of the tools that are available to you? And when you talk to Don Sutton, and then you listen to somebody like Jim Palmer talk, it ain't no accident why they won all those ball games. Besides fastballs, curveballs, and changeups, they they're two of the smartest individuals I've ever met. But I used to love to hear Don Sutton break down a pitcher and uh, and. Uh, I got a lot of good information from him. For sure, for sure. Uh, we were walking through the house earlier. You, you have some memorabilia, and your guy's hanging up on the wall in there, mm-hmm. Whitey Ford, the guy that you grew up watching. I want you to tell me about my guy, Chipper Jones. Oh, Chipper is great. I still text Chipper every once in a while. You know, uh, uh, he goes, hey, Leo, Leo Massoni. <laughs> and I say, yeah, Chipper Jones, you know, because – uh, he, and we always laugh because he says, no savvy, no pitchy. We had a relief pitcher named Juan Berenguer. <laughs> he came in one time after four, and we had a four-run lead. Bobby brought him in, and I shook his hand. He gave me the dead fish. So I said, what's wrong with you? He goes, no savvy, no pitchy. I said, go tell number six that. Don't tell me. Go to, and he, of course, he didn't. But anyway, we had a but we have a, we had a lot of fun with it, you know. It isn't one like, oh, well, what a jerk. We had fun yeah, with it, yeah. you know. You roll with it. Anyway, uh, Chipper, well, you know what? The greatest Atlanta Brave of all time as far as, uh, you know, an everyday player. And Chipper could do it all. A lot of people don't remember. Chipper sacrificed a couple of All-Star games to go play left field for the good of the club. There's a lot of guys that wouldn't have done that. But when I first saw Chipper Jones as a young man, and I didn't even know about his father or anybody. Like, and I said, I told Bobby, I said, he looks like Mickey Mantle, the way he rounds the bases, runs the bases, you know, after hitting a home run. And I didn't realize that that's his father always, you know, modeled, sw- him. modeled him after yeah. Mickey Mantle, and I didn't know that. And uh, uh, but yeah, Chipper was, you know, he was your all-American guy, switch hitter, third baseman, hit with power, hit with average. And Chipper reminded me of Maddox in a way, only on the opposite side of the ball. Maddox never forgot what guys hit against him or how he got them out, and Chipper never forgot either on the other side five years ago or whatever how this guy got him out and what he's going to try to do again. So I think that's a pretty good compliment that those two guys uh, uh, never forgot nothing. I'm going to take a little bit of a side turn here, but there's a story that I know you tell that I absolutely love. It's about Greg Maddox being on the mound, and, and there's a mound visit, and he basically calls the play. And you tell that story so well. I was hoping you could do it. Oh, it's he couldn't get Luis Gonzalez out. You know, every pitcher has somebody they can't get out. 
So he told Bobby, he said, look, he said, if you want to put Louis Gonzalez on, we'll put him on. And Bobby goes, okay. He said, because Bobby refused to have Maddox put have him put anybody on, because we we have, we we didn't think there was a hitter alive that he was going to get a hit off of him. And uh, so anyway, uh, he said, if the game's on the line, we'll go ahead and put him on. Bobby goes, okay. If that's what you want to do, that's what we'll do. Well, the game was on the line in the seventh inning with Louis Gonzalez up, first base open. And Bobby goes, what do you think, Leo? He goes, here's the guy that you know. He said he didn't want to pitch to if the game was on the line. I said, you know what I'd do, Bobby? And he goes, what? I said, if I were you, I'd go on out there and ask him what he wants to do because he knows better than you and I what he wants to do. He goes, you know what? You're right. So he goes out to the mound, and he goes, okay, Mad Dog. He said, we're going to go ahead and put this guy on. And uh, that's their talking. So Bobby comes in and sits down. And he goes, well, wait till you hear this. I said, what are we doing? What are we doing? He goes, well, I went out there to tell him. I said, well, here's the guy to put on. He goes, and, Mad, and, 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 and Mad Dog goes, now, wait a minute, Bobby. Give me two pitches. He goes, if I get behind in the count, two balls and no strikes. He said, I'll put him on. He said, but I think I can pop him up to third. So Bobby says to me, he goes, Leo, he told me he thinks he can pop him up to third. Let's see how this turns out. He popped him up to chipper in foul territory, third base. Unbelievable. Called it. What, what a great moment! I mean, that's just something you don't hear about, no. you know, until years later. No, but no, I know. We you keep keep everything quiet. Keep everything quiet. That's just a great story. Uh, yeah. Another guy that I really want to take a minute to focus on because this is a guy who I really wish the Braves would retire his number. Uh, he's he's already in the Braves Hall of Fame, he's credited by a lot of the Hall of Famers that are already in Cooperstown. Possibly a future Hall of Famer, I believe, should be Andrew Jones. Yeah. Uh, just how many? How much ERA did did he help uh, keep down? I used to tell Andrew that he should win the Fireman of the Year award for all the saves. <laughs> you know, besides playing center field, I see he saved more games. And I remember when uh, Andrew was a rookie, and uh, the guys would say, "Hey, Leo, would you go tell Bobby if he can start that rookie in center field if he wants to? It's okay with us." <laughs> you know, so Andrew was a great center, greatest center fielder I've ever seen. I thought that Andrew was the greatest center fielder I've ever seen. The second best during that time frame was Jim Edmonds in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And those two guys. But Andrew, not necessarily climbing the wall or going in a gas, but taking away that line drive base hit. Yeah. You think, well, that's a base hit to center. And he'd be down there diving head first. And you have the glove in front of his face and catch it and take away the base hit. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, he hit 400 and, what, 30 home runs? Something like that. Yeah. You know, everybody saw, well, 260. Uh, everybody's going to find a reason why. If you're a 10-time 10, 10 gold glove winner and you have just as many RBIs in your glove as you do your bat, should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, at 400 homers, I don't know how he's not. Uh, he's He's got a kid that, that's doing pretty good these days. I heard he's real good and going to be a number one pick. Yeah, uh, it looks like he's headed to Baltimore. Uh, oh. <laughs> I, I was just – I had to mention that. But, yeah, and, and – He'll do fine. He'll do great. Uh, but, yeah, Andrew, obviously, I, I really think uh, belongs in the Hall of Fame. Such great talent through those eras. And, and, obviously, great talent in the pitching department as well and pitching coaching department as well. I, I want to thank you for being here. Uh, before we go, I would be I, – I, I have to mention this. You're going into the Braves Hall of Fame this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know it means the world to you. Um, it, it's it's going to happen in July, Alumni Weekend. I know the fans are going to rock the house. What are, you look at, what are you looking forward to most? I don't really know, you know. All I know is we're going to put the icing on the cake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just uh, – uh, it, it, I can't describe it. I'm just sitting here trying to think what I'm going to say, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, what an honor. Sure. What a tremendous honor uh, when you read the names that are in the Atlanta Braves Hall of Fame and the, the Braves Hall of Fame period, you know. It's just uh, – it boggles my mind. It's a tremendous honor, and uh, I owe a lot of people a lot of uh, uh, gratitude for this long journey, you know. And uh, but uh, boy, what a journey it's been, you know. And uh, of course, the 14 straight is the best journey of all. Well, Leo, coming from a fan, uh, you've earned it. You belong there. Can't wait to see you enshrined in there. And, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been canceled twice. I know. Come on, guys. This is the class of 2020. <laughs> well, again, you belong there. Can't wait to All see right. you there. Congratulations. All right, thanks. Thank you so much for the invite. My pleasure. 
Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview with longtime pitching coach and Braves legend, Leo Mazzoni. But if you're a young pitcher or youth baseball coach, or you just want to learn more about pitching, I got something for you. Go pick up How to Hit Spots by Dan Lazardini, brand new sponsor of On Deck. He's got very similar concepts to Leo Mazzoni, all about location. That's the key for young pitchers. If you want more, all you got to do is go over to Amazon, but I made it easier for you. The link is down below in the description. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time right here at On Deck. Baseball fans, make sure you like and share this video and subscribe to this channel. As always, thank you for your support.